On March 24, 1967, 10 intercontinental ballistic missiles went offline at an underground launch control facility at Maelstrom Air Force Base, Montana. Robert Salas, a former United States Air Force captain who had been the nuclear missile crew commander at the time, was on site when the ICBMs became inoperable, coinciding with calls from security personnel above ground who said they observed an unidentified flying object hovering near the facility's gate. Just eight days earlier, a similar incident had occurred where several ICBMs went offline at another of Maelstrom's launch control facilities. Within months of the incident, an almost identical series of events would transpire at Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, where ICBMs were again disabled, coinciding with sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena. These incidents and others like them have occurred worldwide at nuclear facilities. The question is, why are UFOs so interested in our nuclear capabilities? Throughout history, unexplained aerial phenomena, or UAPs, have shocked, frightened, and fascinated sky watchers. And in the last century, more than a few have been reported in military context. In late World War II, U.S. airmen called them Foo Fighters, strange orange flying lights by the French-German border. During the Korean War, some soldiers claimed a blue-green light emitting pulsing rays made their whole battalion sick with what to some resembled radiation poisoning. Less known, in the last 75 years, high-ranking U.S. military and intelligence personnel have also reported UAPs near sites associated with nuclear power weaponry and technology, from the early atomic bomb development and test sites to active nuclear naval fleets. All of the nuclear facilities, Los Alamos, Livermore, Sandia, Savannah River, all had dramatic incidents where these unknown craft appeared over the facilities and nobody knew where they were from or what they were doing there. Nuclear adjacent sightings go back decades, says Robert Hastings, a UFO researcher and author of the book UFOs and Nukes, Extraordinary Encounters at Nuclear Weapon Sites. Hastings says he's interviewed more than 160 veterans who have witnessed strange things in the skies around nuclear sites. These are objects being tracked on radar, performing at speeds that no object on Earth can perform. I witness military personnel observe them. You have jet pilots witnessing these incidents that are often highly trained personnel with top security clearances. In recent years, their reports are being corroborated by sophisticated technology. In late 1948, green fireballs were reported in the skies near atomic laboratories in Los Alamos and Sandia, New Mexico, where the atomic bomb was first developed and tested. A declassified FBI document from 1950 mentions flying saucers measured almost 50 feet in diameter near the Los Alamos labs. More than a dozen workers from the Nevada Desert Atomic Test Site, where scores of A-bombs were detonated in the post-World War II years, says UFO activity was so commonplace there, employees were assigned to monitor the activity. In the 1960s and 70s, repeated UFO sightings emerged at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana, a storage site for nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles. At one such alleged sighting in 1967, former Air Force Captain Robert Sellis says several of those missiles became inoperative at the same time 
Base security reported seeing a glowing red object about 30 feet in diameter hovering over the facility. Salas, who commanded ICBMs as a launch officer and later worked in the aerospace industry and at the Federal Aviation Administration, confirmed the missiles began going into what's called a no-go situation, or unlaunchable. From the beginning of the atomic age, UFOs have had a vested interest in our use of this technology. Why? Could it be they are afraid of us? or afraid of what we may do with this new advancement. As humans, we fail to understand that we live in a universe teeming with life. We are not alone and never have been. Life is abundant in our galaxy and some of those life forms are technologically advanced species just as we are. Therefore, what we do can affect them and what they do can affect us. We have yet to realize that we live in a galactic population and we must learn to live with other races as well as with the race differences here on our own planet. This next step in our evolution will likely usher in a new awareness of our cosmic brothers and perhaps if we learn from our mistakes then we won't take our recklessness into the cosmos. This may be the very reason UFOs and UAPs have taken a vested interest in our world and those who inhabit it. Imagine you are an intelligent spacefaring race traveling through the galaxy when suddenly your sensors detect a nuclear explosion on a world thought to be primitive compared to your own race. you would change course and investigate it, right? This appears to be what happened in 1947 when the first Trinity atomic bomb was detonated in New Mexico. UFOs began to be sighted within days. UFO reports came in at an increased speed, including a possible crash near Roswell. When we detonated our first atomic bomb, we got their attention. It is believed we were already being monitored well before the atomic age, with Foo Fighters sighted during World War II and even further back in antiquity. However, the first nuclear explosion seems to have brought us and our planet under more scrutiny. Nuclear weapons are incredibly dangerous and we still don't know the cosmic effects of splitting the atom. Our scientists theorize that this one detonation could have been felt across our solar system and beyond. Indeed, at the time, some scientists believed it could ignite the atmosphere and burn the surface of the Earth away, killing everyone. But we did it anyway, despite the warnings. To any alien observers of our world and our primitive race, this would have been a serious turning point. Our young and inexperienced race of humans were now playing with an advanced technology with no regard to its consequences and effects on the rest of the cosmos. A very worrisome issue for any extraterrestrial race monitoring our evolution and advancements over time. What would we do with this new knowledge? Use it to safely power our technology? Or as we had just demonstrated, use it in warfare? Once we figured out how to split the atom, what was the very first way we used it? We built a bomb. Then we built more bombs and used them on our neighbors in Japan. Then we began an arms race with our neighbors building more and more bombs and stockpiling them for future wars. 
nuclear missiles, ballistic missiles, low-yield and high-yield weapons, and we advanced our delivery systems so we could launch them from several sites, drop them from airplanes, and even shoot them off from nuclear-powered submarines anywhere in the world, all with the intent of being the first to obliterate our enemies. To any alien race observing the Earth, this would be total madness, and yet we continue to do this today. Not only our nation, but several nations around the planet are currently stockpiling and creating new nuclear weapons for mass destruction. If you were an alien race observing Earth, what would you think of us humans? At the very least, they would probably want to keep a keen eye on us, lest we advance further and take our warlike tendencies into space and closer to them. As we discovered by splitting the atom, Nuclear energy is a powerful and almost unlimited energy source. Since that first atom bomb, we have also created nuclear power plants and nuclear submarines, both of which seem to be of interest to UFOs and UAPs. It's likely any alien race might see this as a serious concern but it's also possible they may see this as a new and powerful resource for them. Once we entered the nuclear age, our advancements could signal a new location to tap into this energy source to power their craft or recharge on their way to another destination. UFOs and UAPs may be borrowing power from our infrastructure in order to replenish their energy needs. They may be happy we made this technological advancement because they can use the energy source as well. UFOs are often seen near nuclear power stations as well as nuclear bases and weapons platforms. They're also detected near nuclear-powered submarines in the ocean. An unidentified flying object was located near a nuclear power plant close to Russia's second city of St. Petersburg, according to new reports in 2023. An alert signal was sounded around the Leningrad nuclear power plant in the Russian town of Zanavi Bor. Local and state media reported this. The object was moving at around 200 kilometers per hour, that's 124 miles per hour, at an altitude of approximately 33,000 feet, Russian sources reported. The alert triggered a special response status. A military officer told a Russian online newspaper, Reserve Colonel Andro Koshkin, then suggested to state media, there was nothing unusual here. This is a regular situation, indicating this happens often in Russia. Russian authorities temporarily closed the airspace above St. Petersburg after confirmed reports of an unidentified object circulating. All flights were briefly suspended from the city's main airport. An unidentified aerial object was also reported in the skies above Russia's Rostov Oblast in early January, according to local officials. The area's regional governor said authorities had made the decision to liquidate it. Air defense systems were alerted to a small object in the form of a ball flying at an altitude of one and a half miles. It was located near the village of Sultan Sala and was flying freely in the wind, he added. The sky is covered by anti-aircraft defenses, he wrote. 
urging members of the local community to remain calm. To ensure security, all forces and means are involved. Several sightings of unidentified objects have been reported since the beginning of 2023, including several in North American airspace. Newly released UK government files of reported sightings of UFOs include a 1993 sighting of something strange hovering over the Hartlepool nuclear power station. The object was seen in the skies over the Teesside and Cleveland area of Northeast England on several occasions in March 1993. As well as hovering above the power plant, it had also been seen over local chemical plants and military installations. A response from the UK Ministry of Defense at the time confirmed that nothing had been picked up on local air control radar, but suggested a possible theory of car headlights reflecting off an atmospheric inversion layer. A report in a local newspaper claims that UFO sightings over nuclear installations are not uncommon. Ufologist Richard D. Hall, also a columnist for the paper, was quoted as saying, there is a history of UFOs taking an interest in nuclear energy, so the sighting at Hartlepool is not a surprise. Although he would not speculate on any likely reason for the mysterious craft's interest in the plant. The government files include a range of UFO-related documents covering the years 1981 through 1996 and are currently available on the website of the UK National Archives. On numerous occasions, UFOs have been reported over nuclear power plants as well as nuclear research facilities and nuclear weapons storage bunkers at military bases. A good percentage of these reports occurred at highly restricted government research and production facilities such as Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Hanford AEC, and Savannah River AEC. Highly trained government scientists and military personnel who had been granted top secret military clearances made many of these reports. In a well-documented series of incidents in early November 1975, nocturnal lights and unidentified mystery helicopters visited a wide spectrum of American military bases and missile sites across the northern tier of this country. Between October 27th and November 10th, reports of UFOs over nuclear weapons storage sites were repeatedly made at Loring Air Force Base in Northern Maine, Wirt Smith Air Force Base in Michigan, Grand Folks and Minot Air Force Bases in North Dakota, and Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana. F-106 interceptors were scrambled out of Maelstrom Air Force Base near Grand Falls, Montana in response to multiple reports of UFOs visiting nearby missile sites near Moore. Arlington, Lewiston, and several missile sites around Maelstrom Air Force Base. These reports led some to speculate that the intelligences behind UFOs have an interest in nuclear weapons and nuclear power. One feature of these reports suggested a direct link dealing with light rays or energy beams being focused on nuclear materials. Multiple independent accounts state that beams of light were directed downward from the UFOs into the nuclear storage bunkers and underground missile silos, perhaps penetrating them beneath the surface. In addition, there have been unsubstantiated rumors from enlisted men that the telemetry of the weapons at some sites had been changed or that other weapons had been rendered inoperative. Some researchers have suggested that the occupants of UFOs 
have a deep concern about the safety of nuclear power and our proliferation of nuclear weapons and are therefore keeping a close scrutiny on these sites. During the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster on April 26th of 1986, technicians reported that they observed a fiery sphere similar in color to brass within 1,000 feet of the damaged Unit 4 reactor during the height of the fire, about three hours after the initial explosion. Two bright red rays shot out from the UFO and were directed at the reactor. It hovered in the area for about three minutes, then the rays vanished and the UFO moved slowly away to the northwest. Radiation levels taken just before the UFO appeared were extreme, and after the rays, the readings dropped considerably. Apparently, the UFO had brought down the radiation level. For United States counties with populations between 50,000 and 101,000, the rate of UFO reports peaks at 37.3 per 100,000 people for these counties with nuclear facilities, and this rate is 2.61 times higher than for similar counties without nuclear facilities. Overall, the rate of UFO sighting reports is 13.84% for nuclear site counties and 9.59% for non-nuclear counties. In other words, they are 1.44 times more likely to occur in these counties. That is an astonishing rate for areas that include some kind of nuclear facility. This report was generated by Donald A. Johnson, a PhD at Sun River Research in New Hampshire and CUFOS. Indeed, the UFO UAP mystery seems to be centered around our nuclear activities. Stephen Bassett, the founder of Paradigm Research Group, who has been trying for years to persuade the U.S. government to investigate the disclosure of the truth about extraterrestrials and UFOs. Bassett claimed that aliens neutralized human nuclear weapons to demonstrate how useless they are against their advanced technology. When asked what motivates aliens to silence our nuclear weapons, Bassett argued that several eyewitnesses have observed aliens easily controlling our nuclear arsenal and added that it is not intended to threaten us, but merely to convey a message that these things are futile. He stated in an interview with the Daily Star, they keep turning off our nuclear weapons time and time again, but it doesn't mean they're evil. The eyewitnesses who have witnessed this believe that it's not an act of hostility, but rather to convey that these things are useless against them, and it only contributes to humanity's killing each other. So why not get rid of it? That's their interpretation. Former officer Dr. Robert Jacobs has briefed AARO on a 35 millimeter film he shot at the Air Force in 1964 that allegedly caught a flying saucer shooting a test missile out of the sky. Jacobs, a former Air Force officer who testified to AARO was in charge of a telescopic camera team that filmed test missile launches at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California in the 1960s. He claims he reviewed footage of a September 15, 1964 launch where a disc flew up to the moving missile, shot a series of beams at it, and sped away, 
causing the dummy warhead to topple out of the sky. Jacob said he was told to keep quiet about the footage by his boss, Major Florenza J. Mansman, who viewed it with him in a meeting with two CIA officers in the days after the incident. Mansman, who died in 2000, confirmed the account in a May 1987 letter to UFO researcher Scott Crane and said he watched the video four times before the CIA officers shipped it to an undisclosed location on the East Coast. It seems by 1965 the UFOs were becoming very interested in our nuclear facilities. In October of 1965, Philip Parker on an aerial photography mission was flying with pilot H.T. Mayhew near the Perth Church Road Lake Norman crossing. Their plane was flying at about 1,000 feet as they circled the lake near the McGuire Nuclear Station when they noticed three bright objects to their right. Pilot Mayhew gave his plane full throttle and they rose barely high enough to escape the UFOs which were flying in formation 100 feet below them. Unnerved as he was, Parker was able to take one photograph of the three circular UFOs above Lake Norman, which is bordered by the Catawba Lincoln, Gaston Merkelsburg, and Iredell counties in North Carolina. Retired Air Force Captain David Schindel gave a detailed account of the unidentified aerial phenomenon encounter at a facility in the Minot Missile Field in the 1960s. He related the account when giving testimony at a press conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. In September of 1966, a Minuteman ICBM launch control officer and deputy commander of a launch crew stationed at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, was involved in a UFO incident where a flying object tampered with and took down a total of 10 nuclear-tipped ICBM missiles by rendering them unlaunchable. It all began early one morning when they were having breakfast and listening to a television newscast by a TV station in the town of Minot. The newscaster announced that residents of Mohal, North Dakota saw strange lights west of town that night, which were attributed to a UFO. This caught their attention because they were scheduled to relieve and replace the current Minuteman ICBM launch crew at November Flight Launch Control Center, which was three miles west of town. During the pre-departure crew briefing on base that morning, where 15 two-man officer crews would meet each morning prior to going into their assigned launch control centers, they were told that a few missiles at November flight had gone off alert, but nothing more was said about this. After that briefing, several missile crews mentioned about what they heard on the news that morning, and the crew commander also acknowledged that he had heard the news. When the crew commander said he arrived at November flight launch control facility, the commander debriefed a tech sergeant who described what he and others had seen that night. He described a large object just outside the perimeter fence with bright flashing lights, but without noise, and it hovered close to the ground. He estimated the object to be 80 to 100 feet wide. After many minutes passed, the object then glided to the north end of the building and out of sight but it then became visible to security guards in the security control section of the building. With security and other personnel viewing the object through security control windows and with the security personnel preferring to remain in the building, it was just a short period of time before the object abruptly took flight and it disappeared within a second. There were eight people topside within the building who saw this object, and it included six security personnel, a facility cook, and the site manager. They all confirmed it was a terrifying experience to behold. They knew the object was not a helicopter, 
and base choppers normally did not fly at night, especially without notice to the facility. The commander and I entered the elevator next to the security center, which lowered us 60 feet below ground to where the hardened launch control center capsule was located. Two officers inside the silos indicated the missiles were all off alert and unlaunchable. The on-duty crew told us that the missiles went down when the flying object was hovering next to the main gate and above the underground capsule. The crew was communicating with the head security guard topside during the entire time of the incident. The commander was told by OSI that we were to forever keep our lips zipped about the incident and he was told that as far as you are concerned, it never happened. We were even instructed to never talk to each other again about the incident. In effect, the Air Force confirmed the seriousness and reality of the UFO incident. They were never told what the security classification of the incident was. They were never instructed or trained on what to do if another incident should ever happen again and other missile crews were never informed of their incident or of the other UFO incidents in the missile field at the time. This is how the military in the 1960s handled UFO and UAP reports. The information was sent up the chain of command but all officers were instructed not to talk about it. This secrecy has hindered the ability for researchers to study and quantify the phenomenon. Though the subject was discussed at high levels and taken very seriously, lower levels within the military were in the dark as to what was going on. As a result, much information was lost and the ability to track the phenomenon was almost non-existent. If it were not for a handful of whistleblowers, we may have never known about the severity and scrutiny of UFOs and UAPs on our military facilities. Robert Salas' UFO story began on night shift working in a top secret facility monitoring nuclear warheads. Salas, a young Air Force First Lieutenant, was on duty deep underground on March the 14th of 1967 at Montana's Maelstrom Air Force Base when he received a phone call from the flight security controller working topside. The non-commissioned officer reported some unusual lights making strange maneuvers in the sky. It was non-threatening but notable. Only minutes later, the controller called back. This time, his tone was frantic over the phone. He screamed about a large glowing red object hovering over the facility's front gate, and his men were ready with weapons drawn to confront whatever it was. According to an affidavit he signed later, Salas ordered the controller to not let anything get past the gate. After that, Salas woke his commanding officer, First Lieutenant Frederick Mewald. As Salas recounted the unfolding situation, alarms flashed red on the command console, indicating that all 10 Minuteman III nuclear ICBMs under the facility's control were unable to launch. Someone, or something, had disabled the missiles. Some lights indicated a fault code for guidance and system failure and some of the fault lights also had the attached security violation indicators blinking brightly. It meant a security breach at the launch site. Salas quickly dispatched a team to investigate. The team reported that personnel at the launch site had witnessed the same unexplained object, but it was already long gone. Just as quickly as it began, the event was over. The Air Force Office of Special Investigations later told Salas 
not to speak about his experience again and classified the incident at the secret level. Salas signed a 2010 affidavit regarding his 1967 incident, hoping the move would help other veterans come forward with their own accounts of unexplained activity. Salas, undeterred by Washington's previous dismissals, continues his efforts to compel government officials to take veterans' UFO experiences seriously. He also warns that UFO sightings tend to occur at nuclear weapon sites. On October 19, 2021, Salas held a press conference sharing veterans' UFO accounts. Some had recorded their experiences before they died, such as U.S. Navy pilot J.G. Clarence Bud Clem. Clem had recorded his account of a January 1945 incident that he witnessed over the Hanford site in Washington State. Hanford produced plutonium for the Manhattan Project, supplying the nuclear core that went into Fat Man, the atomic bomb the U.S. dropped on Nagasaki, Japan in 1945. Klim and his two wingmen saw on the ground radar that an unknown aircraft had entered the area near the plutonium facility. The two other pilots jumped into their Grumman F-6F Hellcat fighter aircraft. As their 2,200 horsepower engine sputtered the propellers to life, Clem went to the radar tower to relay the readings over the radio while the pilots followed the unidentified bogey. The glowing fireball shot off too fast for the pilots to follow. Clem noted that the Navy logs never reflected the intrusion. Of all the three initialed agencies in the government, the CIA has been involved in UFO and UAP studies throughout the 50s, 60s, and till today. Because of the tense Cold War situation and increased Soviet capabilities, a CIA study group saw serious national security concerns in the flying saucer situation. The group believed that the Soviets could use UFO reports to touch off mass hysteria and panic in the United States. The group also believed that the Soviets might use UFO sightings to overload the U.S. air warning system so that it could not distinguish real targets from phantom UFOs. H. Marshall Chadwell, Assistant Director of OSI, considered the problem of such importance that it should be brought to the attention of the National Security Council in order that a community-wide coordinated effort towards its solution may be initiated. On the 4th of December 1952, the Intelligence Advisory Committee took up the issue of UFOs. The charge to the panel was to review the available evidence on UFOs and to consider the possible dangers of the phenomenon to U.S. national security. The panel met from the 14th to the 17th of January 1953. It reviewed Air Force data on UFO case histories and after spending 12 hours studying the phenomenon, declared that reasonable explanations could be suggested for most, if not all, sightings. For example, after reviewing motion picture film taken of a UFO sighting near Tremonton, Utah on the 2nd of July 1952 and one near Great Falls, Montana on the 15th of August 1950, the panel concluded that the images on the film were caused by sunlight reflecting off seagulls and that the images at Great Falls were sunlight reflecting off the surface of two Air Force interceptors. 
To meet these problems, the panel recommended that the National Security Council debunk UFO reports and institute a policy of public education to reassure the public of the lack of evidence behind UFOs. It suggested using the mass media, advertising, business clubs, schools, and even the Disney Corporation to get the message across. Reporting at the height of McCarthyism, the panel also recommended that such private UFO groups as the Civilian Flying Saucer Investigators in Los Angeles and the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization in Wisconsin be monitored for subversive activities. During the late 1970s and 1980s, the agency continued its low-key interest in UFOs and UFO sightings. While most scientists now dismiss flying saucer reports as a quaint part of the 1950s and 1960s, some in the agency and in the intelligence community shifted their interest to studying parapsychology and psychic phenomena associated with UFO sightings. CIA officials also looked at the UFO problem to determine what UFO sightings might tell them about Soviet progress in rockets and missiles and reviewed its counterintelligence aspects. Agency analysts from the Life Science Division of OSI and OSWR officially denoted a small amount of their time to issues related to UFOs. These included counterintelligence concerns that the Soviets and the KGB were using U.S. citizens and UFO groups to obtain information on sensitive U.S. weapons development programs, such as the stealth aircraft. The vulnerability of the U.S. Air Defense Network to penetration by foreign missiles mimicking UFOs and advance of Soviet advanced technology associated with UFO sightings was concerning. CIA also maintained intelligence community coordination with other agencies regarding their work in parapsychology, psychic phenomenon, and remote viewing experiments. In general, the agency took a conservative scientific view of these unconventional scientific issues. There was no formal or official UFO project within the agency in the 1980s, and agency officials purposely kept files on UFOs to a minimum to avoid creating records that might mislead the public if released. In the 2000s, the government began to change their ideas on the subject of UFOs. The new term UAP was being used to keep some information that was not classified secret by simply changing the name of the phenomenon. Anyone using internet search engines would not know to use the term UAP rather than UFO so information could be shared across computer platforms, yet still kept out of the prying eyes of the public. In 2004, everything changed when nuclear aircraft on training missions encountered the unknown. Eyewitnesses to the mysterious incidents that took place on the USS Ronald Reagan in 2004 came forward to officials. The nuclear-powered aircraft carrier was allegedly shadowed for up to four hours by a 40-foot ball of fire, which was witnessed by dozens of crew members. Incidentally, Pentagon officials took the rare step of confirming three remarkable recordings depicting U.S. contacts with UFOs in 2021. The Tic Tac film 
which showed an unidentified object being followed by fighter planes was perhaps the most striking of the declassified videos. A U.S. Navy pilot who flew the F-A-18 Super Hornet jet that captured the infamous Tic Tac UFO footage explained how his weapon systems were deactivated during the strange encounter. Lieutenant Commander Chad Underwood said he saw strobe lines on his cockpit radar when he tried to monitor the objects of interest. Several leaked UFO videos and photographs that were submitted to the task force for inquiry have now similarly been validated by defense chiefs. French fighter pilots have also narrated similar incidents over time. In another incident of an eyewitness account, a former U.S. Homeland Security official recently spoke out about the weird things he witnessed while working on a Mexican-American border, including what he believes were UFOs. According to the debrief, newly disclosed footage and testimony from a former Customs and Border Patrol agent indicated repeated encounters with aerial objects that maneuvered far beyond the capabilities of a conventional aircraft. This makes one thing very clear. The UFO incidents that have been overwhelmingly reported by several media channels are not isolated events and are just a few of the many that have been witnessed by sensors and humans alike. However, it is only now that the U.S. is showing urgency in tracking and uncovering the pattern behind these sightings. The United States also earlier verified the existence of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, a Pentagon UFO research program that was terminated in 2017 after a decision by the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee in June of 2020, and it was replaced by the UAP Task Force. Several leaked UFO videos and photographs that were submitted to the task force for inquiry have now been validated by defense chiefs. The many latest entries recorded do not have sensor data and are just stories from people coming forward with older stories that they could not reveal at the time. Now, the U.S. Navy is drafting new guidelines for pilots and other personnel to report encounters with unidentified aircraft, a significant new step in creating a formal process to collect and analyze the unexpected sightings and destigmatize them. The Navy has stated a number of reports of unauthorized and or unidentified aircraft entering various military-controlled ranges and designated airspace has occurred in recent years. A former senior intelligence officer recently told the Washington Post that the newly drafted guidelines for pilots mean the Navy has credible evidence of things that can fly over our country with impunity, defying the laws of physics, and within moments could deploy a nuclear device at will. In addition to unauthorized and unidentified aircraft, the Pentagon refers to such sightings as unexplained aerial phenomenon or suspected incursions. The Rendlesham Forest incident was a series of reported sightings of unexplained lights near Rendlesham Forest 
in Suffolk, England in late December of 1980, which became linked with UFO landings and nuclear bases. This event occurred just outside RAF Woodbridge, which was used at the time by the United States Air Force. United States Air Force personnel, including Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, claimed to see things they described as a UFO. According to Halt's memo, upon entering the forest to investigate, they witnessed a glowing object that was metallic in appearance with colored lights. As they attempted to approach the object, it appeared to move through the trees and the animals on a nearby farm went into a frenzy. After daybreak the next morning, servicemen returned to a small clearing near the eastern edge of the forest and found three small impressions on the ground in a triangular pattern as well as burn marks and broken branches on nearby trees. Later that evening, according to Hull's memo, three star-like lights were seen in the sky, two to the north and one to the south, about 10 degrees above the horizon. Hull said that the brightest of these hovered for two to three hours and seemed to beam down a stream of light from time to time. The beams were directed towards the nuclear arsenal of stored weapons at the base. A similar attraction of UFOs toward nuclear bases was noticed in Canada as well. A report from Winnipeg reveals that over 200 years, there have been 2,000 UFO sightings reported in the Canadian province of Manitoba. In the mid-1970s, there were numerous UFO sightings all along the U.S.-Canadian border, with Manitoba being one of the places where a large number of sightings occurred. These sightings included a high number of cattle mutilations and were often seen over restricted areas where nuclear activities were conducted. Chris A. Rakloski, a Canadian UFO researcher, has studied UFO sightings in Canada for over 25 years and concluded that Manitoba has a large history of close encounters with aliens. His UFO research, which contains 30,000 reports, has been donated to the University of Manitoba. In 2017, author Grant Cameron published a book entitled Charlie Red Star, True Reports of One of North America's Biggest UFO Sightings, in which he described in detail the largest UFO sighting in history witnessed by Manitobians. The Providence was stunned by the object known as Charlie's Red Star, which had been seen almost every night in 1975. Cameron claims the Manitoba UFO sightings have connections to nuclear weapons because 35 years later, he found out that the government secretly installed nuclear missiles and other weapons in restricted areas just south of the border. He believes that the sightings stopped after the missiles had been removed in November of that year. The author thinks that the nuclear technology that humans possess could have been created after extraterrestrial contact. As of 2021, humanity has about 13,410 nuclear weapons, thousands of which are on hair trigger alert. While stockpiles have been on the decline following the end of the Cold War, every nuclear country is currently undergoing modernization of its nuclear arsenal. 
The Bulletin advanced their symbolic doomsday clock in 2015, citing, among other factors, a nuclear arms race resulting from modernization of huge arsenals. In January 2020, it was moved forward to 100 seconds before midnight, symbolizing we are much closer to a nuclear apocalypse. If UAPs and UFOs have the ability to render our nuclear missiles and power stations inactive, this would be a serious concern for not only our government, but every nuclear-capable nation on Earth. It may be that the aliens who control UAPs, if that is the case, do not want us using these weapons and are showing us they can stop a nuclear war before it even begins. Is this out of concern for us as a species? Or would it affect them in some negative way also? Perhaps it would prevent them from tapping into our energy systems to replenish their own craft. Or nuclear weapons and detonations may be affecting space itself or interdimensional doorways they use to get from one solar system to another. The enormous energy released by a nuclear explosion affects gravity and other natural energy sources. It could be that misuse of nuclear power may affect the portals they use to travel the galaxy, causing disturbances in their navigation and destination matrices. Nuclear energy emitted by our bases, power plants, and bombs may be affecting the technology they use to make UAPs fly or their propulsion systems. We simply don't know how our meddling with atomic power could be affecting other species in the galaxy and they are very concerned what we may do with it. If we continue to abuse the technologies we have discovered and created, the time may come when they have no choice but to intervene. Full disclosure of the UAP mystery 
may not be a joyous occasion where we meet aliens and know for sure we are not alone. It may be an intervention whereby the aliens dictate terms to us on what we can and cannot do. In any case, they are watching and scrutinizing the moves and advancements we make, as well as how we use and deploy nuclear capabilities. Perhaps one day we will live in harmony with our alien brothers. However, we must learn to live with ourselves first and stop creating destructive weapons whose sole purpose is annihilation. Six, five, four, three, two, one.